everybody. So welcome to the very first annual Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase. You might be asking yourself, why is there a showcase? Well, I often get the question, which tool is right for the job, especially when I am dealing with knowledge graph and modeling questions. And what I would like to do is share with you some tools that I often point people to, some that are new on the scenes, some that are going to be a surprise. And before you ask, none of this is sponsored. I have not been paid to do any of these. I reached out to everybody on my own time. They were kind enough to meet with me and film these. So I hope that these honest reviews, all of these are my own opinions that I often help people with when they ask me questions. I hope this helps you in your search for the next knowledge graph technology that you want to dive into a little bit deeper. All of the vendors that I'm going to be talking to, I have more information and their contact information in the description below. And if I missed any tools that you wanted to see me review, or if you have questions about the ones that we are reviewing, please leave them in the comments below. I and the people that I'm talking to will be able to answer those questions for you. All right, and so what is the criteria that I'm going to be walking through? There will be a summary at the very end of each video describing the answers to each of these questions as well as a summary of any other little tidbits that we find out. So the main things that I ask are, what are the use cases that the tool is usually or best suited for? Also talking about that, what features do they have to actually support those use cases? That's pretty important in understanding if they're going to meet your needs. The other thing I like to talk about is what kind of data, what kind of format, and what kind of query language does the tool support? Two additional things I talk about, because I think they're pretty important, is first, interoperability. If a tool is not interoperable, sometimes it's a make or break moment. Other people don't mind if it's not interoperable. So we will certainly see people on both sides of the coin in these reviews. The other part is, is this SaaS or not? A lot of people that have small development teams or no development teams don't have the resources to set something up that's not SaaS. So I will be asking these questions as well as many more. So please join me in the next few episodes. So with that, let's check out this video's tool of choice, which is... All right, and with that, let's go kick it off. All right, so Tomas, can you walk me through what is Graken? What is um, so interesting about this? How would you describe it? If I, if, I tell, um, if I tell you that my father is Bob, if I tell you that my father Bob has a sister Susan, if I now ask the question, who is my aunt? Now, given those two facts, you would know, though, of course, that the answer is Susan. But oh, I love this. I don't know if this has anything to do with the science that you're looking at, but, you know, Hobbes discourse analysis is talking a lot about this. And that was, you know, something that was done in, in research quite some time ago, but it's talking about those hops that people make in logic as they're talking to one another, because we're people, we can fill in the blank. I, I love that because now you're, you're making it a little bit easier for people to get at that information. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and so the, the hops that you're referring to specifically, if we, if we think of that question, effectively we're abstracting two hops, which is from me to my father, to my aunt, to, to my sister, to his sister, you're mm -hmm. abstracting those two hops into just one hop. Now that's fairly simple to do and humans can do it. And there's a lot of these hops that we can do in, 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 in you know, common speech, but when it gets to, you know, 10 hops or hundred hops or oh, yeah. terabytes of data, that's really where specifically the science of automated reasoning or, or more specifically the uh, symbolic artificial intelligence becomes necessary to solve those problems. So the, the, effectively the way we then build Graken is that we, 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 we build a data model, which is a direct implementation of effectively a concept level schema. So that's why we don't actually, we don't actually expose any nodes and edges. We just, works, we just work with entities, relations, and attributes. That's the model that gets exposed to the developer. Mm -hmm. and that gets interpreted by a reasoning engine every time you query for your data. When the, the model is also fun, fundamentally funded on hypergraph theory, and that allows you for hyperrelations uh, and so forth. And can you define hyperrelations? I think some people that are going to be watching this video might not know what that is. If you think of a effectively a binary relation, which is what you see in a triple, uh, in a property graph, there you effectively are dealing with the 
an edge is effectively defined as a pair of, of nodes, right? So you have always two nodes, you have a start node and you have an end node. Mm -hmm. A hypergraph or hyper edge or hyper relation, you're dealing with a set. So you can have effectively an N number of nodes in one edge or in one relation. It's almost as if you are turbocharging the regular triples structure that we are all more familiar with. So what are some of the benefits of, of going this direction instead of a traditional property graph or triple store? In, in practice, the result is that a, a triple or property graph is effectively a lower level data model, mm -hmm. um, what we will call a concept level schema. So the hypergraph is really, um, is, is really a, a way for us to implement the concept level schema. So anything that you can model in, in effectively a, a property graph can be expressed in a, in a richer way to, a con in a concept level uh, schema. So the schema itself has more semantics effectively represented. The, the way to think of it is that it's, it's, a, it's a higher level data model. So what what does this thing look like? How would somebody be able to uh, move around it? And I think that you you did mention um, the the data model itself isn't exposed to developers. So what is exposed to the developers? How would they get um, involved in something like this. So currently the software you're looking at right now, this is called Graken Workbase. It's effectively Graken's IDE. So I can build a schema, I can also visualize data. And right now there's a, it's a data set on my computer running, it's a financial data set. And we've asked the question um, at the top here that says uh, match dollar B is a bank. So what we're saying with that first statement, we're saying there's a variable that's called B and that we assigned to uh, entity type bank. Mm -hmm. And then there's also another uh, another entity type, this this dollar R, which we assigned to the risk to the entity type risk score, that has an attribute risk level with a value of high. And then what we want to say is we, we say that the bank plays the role of risk subject, and the risk score plays the role of risk value in a risk exposure relation. So this is the query that you are constructing based on the shape of the data that's underneath. Is that accurate? That's right. So, okay. and, so uh, for those perhaps unfamiliar with Graken, we, uh, we implement schema constraints at the database level. So we declare our schema beforehand. So this must adhere to your schema. There's one immediate thing to note here. So firstly, the two banks that have been highlighted, one end securities and RBS, are effectively the two results that we're getting back. And they have been connected to these three risk, risk scores, civil unrest, war score, and cybercrime. Now, bear in mind, and this is the first type of inference that Graken does, is that uh, we've queried for a type called risk score. However, we have been returned types cybercrime, type war, and civil unrest entity types. So the, these are subtypes of parent risk score. So this is an example of is one type of Graken inference engine, which is effectively the type inference. So, Graken so when you when you're talking about that inferencing, um, if you're not exposing the schema to the developers, um, how do they know what the end result of that inferencing is going to be? So, what you just described is a hierarchical structure. So, does Graken? How does Graken figure out that that's a hierarchical? It, um, so, I mean, to, to be clear, the schema is defined by the user. So the, ah, gotcha. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Think, think how in SQL, you know, you create your tables, you define yep. column names, same thing with Graken. Um, but just to go back to the example, so we get back these risk scores, these subtypes. Now, the second thing that we want to note here is that these four relations are what we call inferred relations. So they don't exist in the graph, right? They're not persistent in the database. We're being presented them right now as if they are persistent. However, if we look here on the right, we see that it says inferred relation. So they are effectively inferred. Um, now, what that means is that we can get an explanation why that, why they were inferred. So if I press explain on this button here, I hmm. see that under the hood, it shows me that this Wallian bank is, is an owner of this energy asset, Akata. And Akata Ooh. seems to be connected in a jurisdiction. I like this. I mean, this is this is pretty slick. I mean, it's it's really difficult sometimes when you are running inferencing on some of those black box systems, but you don't have any control over it. This seems to give you that kind of control. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. So this is one explanation only for this relation. 
um, which which shows this connection, this effectively this these three hops being abstracted into just one hop. But then if we look at this one here, we see that so there's a cyber attack effectively on RBS, and the inference shows us that attack. There's this there's an identifier of that attack, and RBS seems to be um, subject to it. But bear in mind now. This relation here is, is not inferred. So this one shows us as an actually you know, persisted, but this one is, is inferred. So we have to be a chain rule because this one is an inference. And that means I can press explain again and I get the explanation for that. And it shows me that there's a, there's a subsidiary to RBS, this post-ikintestot, which seems to be the actual subject of the attack, but it doesn't stop there because it's actually not a direct subsidiary either. It's a subsidiary of a subsidiary because that one was also an inferred relation because Postikintestot is actually owned by Nordis Renting, which is a subsidiary of RBS. So we, we would have to go through each of the dots essentially to find that out, right? If you're building software, you're not going to use WordBase to check if this is an inferred relation. You're going to call the API and, hey, and ask Greg, and, hey, is this an inference? So what if you find something that's wrong? How can you go back and, and fix it once you've discovered an error? So wrong is only relative to what you've defined it to be wrong. So wrong will always be right in Graken's context. So if, if wrong means that you've defined a wrong rule, and that's because Graken is a, is a deterministic system. So all the inferences mm -hmm. are always fully deterministic. So they can't change, like, unlike a machine learning model that may be undeterministic in some of the inferences that it makes. Graken is always fully explainable and deterministic, given the same data and the same schema and rules. I see. So to summarize, because the end user, the, the developer in this situation, has full control of the schema, if they put a rule in place with whatever their structure is, and it's not, um, the one I always use is um, birds have wings, things that have wings can fly, but what about a penguin, right? Yeah. Um, so if you accidentally did that, you could discover that by looking at the inferred relations here, but it would then be up to you to go back and fix your schema because you made that mistake. Exactly right. And the right. schema is flexible, so you can add any type at any point in time. And also the rules, all the rules are, are you can undefine and define them on the fly. And is this schema proprietary to, to you? Graken doesn't follow a particular standard. We decided that knowing, look, and just knowing what standards were available, that none of them were good enough to, to have a, effectively the right balance between how expressive is the model and how simple is it to, 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 to use. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of complexity in a lot of the standards, especially in the, in the knowledge graph space, and that inhibits adoption. And generally, when you want to have a language or a technology, it needs to be, needs to be simple enough, yet expressive enough, for adoption in, in, in most engineering teams. Mm. Let's look at how the schema looks. So we call the model in Grack the knowledge model. And so we say that the knowledge model needs to represent type hierarchies, hyper relations and rules. So everything in Graken is effectively a subtype of a thing. Mm. And then we have entities, attributes and relations as first class citizens in the model. That means any entity can subtype each other if itself. Attributes can subtype itself and mm. patients can have a type hierarchy as well. And then everything, so both, so all entities, attributes, and relations can relate to a relation through roles. So even a relation can be in another relation, or even an attribute can be in a relation. So when you're saying within, it's, it's again, it's a hierarchical structure. So it's not just you're, you're subclassing something for no reason. It actually has a logic to it. For example, being able to uh, create relations between attributes it's that it, is that sometimes the model requires us to model things as, as attributes now you know it's, we've seen so many examples where um where a lot of our users migrated from a property graph where they modeled things as nodes but then actually those were attributes if you really thought of the model those are actually attributes so yeah. that's why we say this is effectively ultimately a higher level model this built on top of a a, a triple or a property graph um format so this is effectively the schema language. So on the left, we have the graphical representation of the schema and on the right, just the, the actual code to declare this schema. Now, um, for perhaps for those unfamiliar with our um, notation here, uh, a rectangle is an entity, a circle is an attribute and a diamond shape is a, is a, is a relation. A relation, yeah. We really try to be practical and simple about it. And that's why you see on the right here, 
Um, there's only about 15, by the way, it's only about 15 keywords in the entire language in Bracken. And, you know, if we can remove things or make them shorter, you know, we, we will do that. We, will, we want to keep it as simple and beautiful. We want people to fall in love with the language. And I'm really proud to say that there, there's, there's so many people that already have. Um, and so, so what we're saying here on the right is saying, we're first declaring that a person is an entity. They have a name, so a name, an attribute, and they play the role of employee. That is it. That's all I say, just to declare that there's a person entity that has an attribute and, and plays a certain role. We do the same with a company, also name it, but instead of playing the employee, they play the employer. And then we have an employment relation that relates to those two employer and employee roles. And then we also declare the, the attribute type. And perhaps for, if, if you're coming at it from an, from an RDF or an OWL perspective, the question we get a lot is why don't we support multiple inheritance? Because Bracken only supports single type inheritance, which you see in the, in the next slide, because we're defining a customer as a subtype of a person just by using the same type notation, customer sub, Mm -hmm. Entity, we say person, and also startup sub company instead of startup sub entity. And now those startups and a customer, they inherit all the properties and roles mm -hmm. that the parent has. So I don't have to redeclare that a startup can play the role of employee. So I, I, I see there's a lot of really cool stuff going on with this, but anytime somebody is talking about not using the standards, the question of interoperability comes up. So is that um, something that your customers you have now are concerned with? So for us as a company, that's not very interesting to invest time in. Mm -hmm. so for us, you know, when we qualify people that may adopt our technology and especially, especially with, with regards to sales opportunities, that's a, that's a you know, if, to be frank, that's a big no-no. Yep. Um, okay. You know. Sure. There's a time, it, it's, it's a business decision, right? So if somebody's business is really needing interoperability because they have a lot of different systems and they all have to talk to each other, or they have a business rule perhaps where they do have to make sure that if they have to switch over to something else in a year or two, that they'd be able to do that easily. So I think that's a business decision. Um, when you get into graph space, the size of data that these types of tools can handle really does vary um, quite a lot. So in, in your um, work that you're doing so far, at what point does the system start to break? So just to give you a little bit of context of where we are before I answer that question. Um, so the way we started building Bracken is, is, I mean, almost from scratch. So building a graph database itself is already a huge endeavor, which is what we're doing. Building a reasoning engine on top of that with a whole new language is, 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 a, is a big, big engineering effort. So we've tried, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we've tried to at least... Um, you invented a language that's very difficult. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I don't want to speak about our own achievements, but you know we, we are very proud of what we've done and there's been a lot of effort and a lot of sweat, tears, and not a lot of blood. So we've worked very hard to make that happen. However, there, there have been some decisions, architectural decisions, that especially uh, up until now, this point have, have affected performance. So performance has, has, been a, has always been an important issue, but um, unlike some of, some of our other friends in the space, performance has not been the single most uh, important goal for us to achieve because we always knew how to effectively get it down the line. So the, the architecture of the current crack conversion 1.8 is based on Janus Graph and Cassandra. That's what we take, and, and on top of that, we build the Bracken. Mm -hmm. For I, I think for most people who know about the space, Janus Graph Cassandra isn't particularly performant with a lot of data. And, and yeah. however, because it allowed us to you know go to market, um, build a community, prove that this is something people wanted to use, it helped accelerate a lot of the development. As of right now, in hopefully two weeks' time. We've re we're going to get rid of Cassandra, get rid of Janus Graph. So we build our entire, entire, we build our own hypergraph database. That's wow. The course of this year. And then instead we use RocksDB under the hood as a very low level persistent storage engine. So you use them as a stepping stone because it was out there. You needed to get to market. And now you're, you're going that next step. Makes we sense. We ripped out things that are very scary to rip out over the course of this year. <laughs> um, high risk, high reward. That's, yes, yes. In terms of performance, we'll, we'll see one or two orders of magnitude performance improvements when 
once Kraken 2.0 is out. But in a general sense, you know, how big of a data set do you think works really well in the current situation, understanding that you are <laughs> very soon going to be um, expanding into bigger and better things? Yeah. So we've tested, uh, Kraken works with a, roughly a couple of billion data concepts. Mm -hmm. That's fine. There's the, the, the difficulty is that sometimes there may be very specific reasoning queries that lead to a bottleneck of one, mm -hmm. one very specific um, inference. And, and, and that can slow things down, but that's because of that one bottleneck. So, um, but overall, Kraken works fine on, on large data sets. It's more the overall performance on read and write that we're improving. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then also the scalability. All right. So Tomas, I really appreciate you taking some time. How would people get a hold of you or others at Kraken to find out more? So if you go to Kraken.ai slash Discord, you'll be able to sign up for our Discord. We've got also a, um, a community swag program. I want to thank Thomas very much and Bracken in general for joining me today and go and check out some of their stuff because at least it's free and open and go and find out if you like it yourself.